Right, well, thank you for coming. Welcome to my talk. It's a bit of a long title. Um, did anyone go to Crestcon this year? Ah, this is good. This is good. You haven't seen this all. Right. My name's Neil Lawrence. Um, I'm on Twitter. That's my name on Twitter. Um, I reply back to people. I talk to people. Feel free to add me. I'd appreciate that. Um, I'm involved in a range of pen testing. I'm a pen tester. Um, I do infrastructure testing, web app testing, a lot of social engineering, internal and external. Um, external social engineering is definitely my favourite. Uh, internal social engineering I do a lot of, but I tend to get quite nervous when I do it. Um, I'm here today to share some tips and tricks with you all. Um, much of what I cover today is actually quite old, but previously talking to people, I found that a lot of people don't do this or don't know about it. And it's something that really interests me, so I wanted to talk about it. I'm interested in functionality, functionality of operating systems. Um, I tend to find zero days, they're a stupid price, um, they look, don't always work. Uh, companies won't buy them, um, it's just not for me. I'd rather attack something that's already there. You all know this, there's no point keep going on about it, but generally attacking with functionality, you're less likely to get picked up by antivirus. Right, SMB. We all know SMB. We've all seen it. There's a nice little pretty picture of it. The following discovery uh, in 1997 by Aaron Spangler was that if you add a file and an IP address to an IE request, a web request, uh, you can initiate an SMB request. This was an incredible discovery and it shows you how old it is. So what does this mean? It means UNC abuse. Uh, in 2016, it's actually more problematic, can't say the word, than back then. Um, UNC has been included in lots of functionality, uh, lots of um, uh, browsers, support, and you'll see later on why. Right, so quick introduction. What is UNC? UNC is Universal Naming Convention. It's a bit boring, some videos later, it gets more interesting. Uh, it's used to specify the location of a, re a resource, um, share files, share drives, things like that. Social engineering. Right, we all know about social engineering. I'm going rapid. I just realised I need to slow down. I do this every time. I do, my, I do my talk in 10 minutes. I will literally be done. Um, right, SMB, UNC. Yeah, a lot of people can say it's boring. Um, I still think it's great because it's a function that's very, very exploitable. You combine that with people, which are the most exploitable. Two of my mates dropped in. Nice of you to join me. <laughs> um, combine it with people, functionality and people together, and you're onto a winner in my mind. So, as pen testers, are we pen testers in this room? Thank you, there's some of us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we love attacking things. Um, we love getting into things. We generally, a lot of people say they enjoy internal testing. May not like travelling, but once we're there, a lot of us like attacking things. It's a lot more fun. It's a lot squidgier. It's great. Um, we love also being remote because we can work from home. So if you can combine sort of internal testing with remote testing, that's a winner in my mind. Right. Before we start social engineering, there's the reconnaissance period, and I'm going to talk a little bit about reconnaissance. This is another area, area of interest for myself. Classic tools for reconnaissance. You would have all used these or know of them or heard of them. Harvester, MetGoofball, Recon and Jade, very good. Parker, uh, Foca, as I should say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a PJ, sorry, there's no kids in the room, but my kids will watch it probably at some point. Um, yeah, uh, they're automated. They have limitations. Um, they can be complex. They don't always work very well. Uh, re rely on sort of API keys. They're not always that in intuitive um, to use. Here's classic examples of manual approaches. We all know about LinkedIn. It's very, very nice to sort of search people out, look at businesses, get a good feel for the business. Uh, Facebook, fantastic source. Go to a corporate website. Um, look at the likes on pictures. Who works for a corporate company here and occasionally likes the corporate pictures? You're kind of encouraged to do it. You feel part of the team. I went to that high, I went to that night out with the company. I like it. Well, I'll come along and I'll scrape their names off because I know that the majority of people who like corporate sites are quite often internal employees. So that's a great source for usernames. Um, Google Images. Who uses Google Images here? 
Oh, I discovered this a few years ago and it just blew my mind. Drag an image, drop it in, it does a search on it. It's incredible. Yeah, grab someone's profile picture, drop it in, and sometimes you get lucky and correlate it to another profile. Even look here if you correlate a business picture to something like Facebook or even better, Plenty of Fish or something like that. Really onto a wheeler there. Um, Pipple, Pipple's a big. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go to. I'm live. <laughs> Social engineering, I'm getting in. Let's get this right. I don't care, I'm getting in. Uh, Pipple. Pipple's a bit filthy. Um, <laughs> it's a people search engine. I probably shouldn't put it on my slides. It's not very corporate. Uh, I occasionally use it. You drop a name into it, next girlfriend, and find out what they're doing. Um, <laughs> Adobe. Uh, we all know about Adobe, and I'll get back to that. Right, my friend's, my friend's face is starting to light up at this point. Um, LinkedIn, I'll explain why in a minute. LinkedIn is a great source, uh, paying to sort of scrape from manually. Most automated tools can be complex. Anyway, one of my friends came up with a tool called Prowl. And uh, anyone here use Prowl? Good. It's good. It seems to be just an attitude for yeah. it's Prowl. <laughs> Please, it's on my friend's uh, GitHub. Um, and uh, I should give you Matt's name, Matt Malego. Matt. It's in the framework as well now. Oh, there you go. it's in the Pentester's framework. So, who I have the name down here, uh, David Kennedy, Pentester framework. Mm -hmm. I know David Kennedy from Twitter and other places, but I'll forget names from doing the talk. Um, fantastic tool. I'll explain why now. Basically, you give it a domain name, and you then basically give it a uh, style of email address that you're looking for, and it will go to LinkedIn for you, scrape it, and Chuck them out. You can get like 50 to 100 email addresses in seconds. Um, and what makes it even cleverer is Matt's included all the LinkedIn dumped hashes and it tells you whether they've been compromised at the same time. So you've got a nice little report that you can use ourselves or usernames, uh, e email, username, <coughs> enumeration for web app testing, remote SC, you've got your email addresses, it's fantastic. You can also say to clients, um, these people, they're compromised on your internal side, their passwords are. Password reuse is massive. So uh, you can turn out to clients and say, there you go, have a list of people who are compromised. I use that tool a lot. <laughs> Sorry, enough sales there. Right, Adobe Breach, LinkedIn. Muslim Match is a new one. Um, they're all gifts that keep uh, giving. I crack passwords, a lot of us crack passwords. We enjoy it, it's fun, it's nice to turn around with a massive database of password hashes and throw a dictionary out here or try and physically crack them. The thing about social engineering, it's not really about that so much anymore. The passwords, while are useful, you can see if password reuse has happened and you can try and authenticate with their OWA using the passwords from LinkedIn or something like that. It's generally fine that these sites don't force complexity. So they're pretty useless. Like Apple or one or dot 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 is their passwords on these sites. What they are useful for is email addresses. Again, uh, you've got a nice little dump there. You can just drag in any email addresses that you didn't get with Proud. You can then look at these other things and drag email addresses out for companies. So, we've got email addresses. I'm trying to slow down. We've got email addresses. What do we do now? If you're going to send an email to a company, if you're going to spoof an internal address and then send it to internal people, it has to look the part. It's got to look real. And the best way to make something look real is to get a signature and get an email from them to get a feel for what it's like. Now, you can cheat because as a pen tester, you have scoping calls and chats and you can talk to the client. You're going to, they're going to send you an email. And I try never to use that because I just see it as cheating. But what I generally do is I will look at their websites and I'll find a contacts page or sales page is even better and just fake an interest. Say, I'm, I'm interested in your product, explain. Or how much is this? And within five minutes, you normally got an eager salesperson phoning you up. Tell them that you want it in an email to show to someone seeing you in your company and bang, you've got an email from them. So you can see their internal emails. You can see what they look like. You've got the signature from it. You've got the style of email. Right, I should very quickly explain why, what you'll use for that email. Well, no, I'm getting forward. I'll come back to that. So you've got a legitimate email from people. So what about you and so? How can we initi initiate SMB connections in Outlook and Office and lots of other things? Has anyone ever done UNC exploits here? Brilliant. So you'll know this. But for people who haven't, in Outlook, how do you do a UNC exploit? I'm not sure if you can see this very well on the board. Uh, you write your email, we've made some changes to your internal SharePoint, um, please click here to check you can still authenticate. You right click the click here and you do hyperlink. <coughs> what you do then, you just add file, dot dot slash slash, your external IP address, which I will not put on my slides, um, 
and then you do a fake directory. That is it. That is a you and so save. And then you can send them the email. That'll work when they click on that. Now, I'm not going to tell you what happens when they click on it yet, for people who don't know. I'll get to that. Outlook. My friend showed me this. Very, very easy to do. Um, there is a Metasploit module that will take any kind of document, any Word documents, which are just PowerPoint, which is different as Word documents, and it will just ask you for a remote um, host IP address, and it spits it out. That's great. And there's occasionally times where you like to sort of do it yourself. So you do little tweaks, because another good thing about this is you can put HTTP address in it as well, and I'll get to that later. Um, but how you do it in Word, you click Quick Parts, go to Field, go down to Include Picture, and then again, just put the UNC link in, and say data not stored in the document, and then hit Go. That's it, your Word document is weaponized. It's ready to be sent to people. Here you go, here's an email. The kind of thing I'd send to people on tests. Um, talking about SharePoint, there's your hyperlink, ready to go. Now, when I previously said, you get an email from someone, I said I'd get back to it, I'm going to now. I'll take the email from them, I'll save it uh, as a HTML, or HTML, HTM, as far as I say on Outlook, and I, before I forward, I'll forward it to myself, before I save it, I'll forward it to myself, and I'll tweak their email, I'll delete all my signatures, all the other signatures, just keep, sorry, their signature, and delete most of their text, and then just change it to what I want. So I've got the same font as them, and I've got the same signature, and then I'll forward that to myself, and then I'll save it. I now have their email customised how I like, and I can drop my UNC link into it. So it looks legit, it feels legit, it hopefully sounds legit. Right, so you email it into a client, and you hope that they click on it. If they do, that's what you get. Username, domain name, and the password hash. That's the important bit. Uh, literally, I do this all the time on a SE test. I'll send emails to people. Um, normally, I'm pretty bad. I have like reconnaissance day, and then I'm just start testing the next day. Normally, towards the end of the day, I'm getting bored and itchy. I can stop it. So I'll send 20 or 30 of these in. And if they're, accept, if they're vulnerable to it, and I'll get to that later, almost instantly <coughs> you get clicks, you get hashes sent to you. So it's like you're, ready, you, well, you're not quite ready to go, but it's a good start. So you've got username, you've got the domain name. Also, the domain name is really important. Once you've got the inside, you want to be able to see that instantly. Right, this is something while sort of testing all this I came across. I noticed with Outlook, if you send an email to people and you do a hyperlink and put an IP address in it, and they send it, they receive it, and they get that. Phishing attempt. But all scary, don't click on it. No one wants red banners when they're sending it to clients. When you do a UNC link, so it's an IP address, it's got a UNC link in it instead, you get nothing. If Microsoft think that's not dangerous, they accept it. I find that quite amusing. Right. Uh, next slide. We're now ready for the first demo. Are there any questions from anyone as we go along, by the way? I've got a question. Go for it. Do any vendor products stop those connections going out, or is it enabled? Yes, so I'll get to that. Um, obviously, anyone here who comes from a firewall background, I think, how the hell does this happen? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, <coughs> ah, I've come across this before. I have to physically close my slides, or else it won't let my desktop for the video. I used to embed my videos directly into my PowerPoint presentations, and I found it often rendered them and looked horrific. So I kind of stopped doing that, and I now do this, which is a bit botched job, but it works. Right. Um, so, I've just received an email, and I've got my listeners. These are two separate machines. This is a remote machine. You can do this across the internet <coughs> as, as attacker listening. This is a client. I've just received the email. And we hit go. Bang, that quick. <laughs> across the internet, it's that quick as well. It's, 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 oh, I'm never going to get bored of this. Uh, interestingly, <laughs> you get that. Afterwards, I have had so many people email me back saying, I've got a problem, it hasn't worked. It has. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell them that. Um, uh, I sometimes like, lose 10, 20 minutes on a test just having amusing conversations with people, supporting them. Does that open up chances to go further with them in terms of social engineering? Because it opens up the dialogue. It does, it does. And I, I said, I'll go to nothing to stop me. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I've had conversations with people where I've, I've physically supported them by sending them a document in afterwards to explain how to do it with a shell in it, but we're jumping in front of I feel sorry sometimes. Like clients, always, this is a question I always get from clients. Can I have a list of the users who clicked on it? And I'm quite crafty. If I get into someone's OWA, I'm going to get a dump of all of their email addresses. So we're talking sometimes like thousands of people. 
And that's there just thinking, shut up, no. <laughs> I will send an email to a thousand of them. And out of that, 70% will click on it. So it's like, you want a list. You can't, they want a list because they want four or five people and they want to go, why have you done this? And make a call out and one of them go, this is wrong. Or use it for internal training, maybe. If it's like hundreds and hundreds of people, they've got the problem. Really, you know, there's something going wrong there. Something's fundamentally broken if all the users are doing it. That's my opinion. Right, so what am I doing now in this next video? Here you go, I'm clicking again, there you go, I'm getting hashes. Right, now, something that's interesting, I'm going to go on to the Word document now. If you watch, this is, this is personally interesting to me, another little <coughs> thing in Windows, which is funny. If you copy it to the desktop and open it, you get no warning. And I opened it, and got hashes. So just open the document. If you copy it to the desktop, you get no warning and you get hashes. Now, if you open it directly from the email, you get that at the top. So, in protected mode or safe mode, click enable to enable it. The minute they enable it, you get that. And it's just knowing little tricks like that. Maybe you want to then, in your email, say to people, copy it to your desktop somehow. I personally think saying stuff like that to people in email seems a bit suspicious and they're going to get a bit like, mm, I don't like that. Right, I'm going to skim through them quickly. Can I skip slides to... No. Thank you, Microsoft. Right, so that was the first video done. Uh, interesting, I wanted everyone to know this. Uh, I get my VMs from Microsoft. Um, they give them out for me. I think we'll have to use them. It's on their website, you just download them. Um, and the reason why I like this is they're typical builds, I think, in my mind. They're built for developers, so they come with like full versions of IE. But does anyone download their VMs from here? Wicked, wicked, brilliant. Best machine as well. Whenever I do like a demo like this, I just spin up a new one, so I know I haven't messed with it. The other thing is you're spotting my videos. Um, I don't tweak things like warnings. I like the warnings. I don't want to disable them. I want to always see them. I want to know exactly what is warning and what's not warning me. Right, the question from yourself. Oh, what am I doing? I'm going the wrong way. I'm very smooth. Right. Is it something to stop this? Here's the answer. Um, we all know that old inbound rules are really, really tight. Uh, AT443 is pretty common. Um, you don't expect to see much more than that. Sometimes you might see a few of ports. Fair enough. Um, outbound rules you generally find not restrictive. And I know a lot of you think you haven't let me so. Well, I do test a lot. Um, and I find that if you click on it, and SMB port 445 comes flying outbound, so I know they're not restricting it. And this is everything from private to public sector. Um, really, really weak outbound firewall rules. Secondly, remote workers. Um, there's the split tunnel versus no split tunnel argument of networking. Um, do you allow internet access directly outbound while they're connected to the VPN, or do you force them to come out of your corporate policy? Now, the secure solution is you force them to their internet to traverse the uh, traverse that right word to go across the VPN and come out so you can control it. But the reality is that's not default settings, and most people don't do that. So the internet breaks out instantly at the home router. So you can have the best outbound policies in the world ever, but I'm talking to people who are working from home, and there's no protection, and they're clicking. I'm still getting hashes. Right, some of you will be thinking, well, you've got a password hash, you have to crack it. Um, I use Rocktastic. Anyone here who's not from Netitude heard of Rocktastic? <laughs> Silence. Golden. Um, it's a dictionary I created, and in a few slides of time, I'm going to get onto why I created it and the differences in between it. Um, I took Rocky, I added words of interest, um, towns, cities, Names, top thousands, male, female names. Football clubs is a massive one. I see Liverpool one all the time. Um, I lowercased it all, and then I copied it and cloned it and cloned it and cloned it. And each time I cloned it, I did things like A's to at symbols. Now, I know some of you are thinking, rules, why not rules? The quick answer is, it speeds it up if you're not using rule. But I will get to that on my slide. Anyway, I combined it back together, and you end up with 1 billion, 133 million, bloody blah, a lot of unique passwords. I throw that at the hashes I collect, and yes, you crack a lot. Um, are there any questions about that? At the beginning. Very, very good question, made my day. Um, about 50 people download it a day, so I know it's popular. <laughs> On Twitter, at the top of my thing, I've got a link to it. 
Um, I haven't got a link here, which I should do. Now, in this demo, I was going to show you cracking the password hashes. Does anyone need to see this demo? Does anyone want to see the demo of just cracking password hashes? It's two seconds long. OK. <coughs> you have seen it before, Dave? Oh, yeah, you have. I'll crack password before, so I've seen it before. Right. Um, for the demo purposes, I'm not using Locktastic because on my laptop, a billion passwords, even with one hash, takes about two minutes to get through. <coughs> Interesting, it takes about two or three minutes to get through. So if you get a password hash, how long does it take you to crack it? It's just one, two or three minutes. Um, but for this video, for this purpose only, I'm using a cut down version of the dictionary. And here you go. With John, John the Ripper, I personally use Hashcat more now. But when I did these videos a long time ago, I was using John the Ripper a lot. And bang, done. There you go. It's not a particularly complex password, as you can see. Uh, it meets Microsoft's complexity settings for domain password complexity. Um, a lot of people will, when, when you enforced, when Microsoft, not when Microsoft, <coughs> but when enterprises started to enforce Microsoft's complexity, users would go, well, I've got my password. Um, I don't want to change it, so I'm going to capitalise the first letter because Microsoft says I have to. I'm going to stick a number in it or a special character because Microsoft says I have to, and that's it. So they took their initial word and just made it suitable for the complexity settings. Worth pointing out, if anyone is thinking, why don't you use rules? Dave might be interested here now. I've started using them. Um, is it me who forced you to use it? Over the years, over the years. It's like, no, just, just use rules, use rules. Um, I started using them with Hashcat, because Hashcat is, as we all know, a lot quicker. We've got a decent graphics card. Having a really good graphics card, or we call the beast, um, it gives us an ability to be able to use ridiculously long passwords, uh, password word lists, with rules, and do it in a reasonable amount of time. So I got interested, and I started, uh, it's one of my things at work, I've been told to sort of look into this more in depth. And I started doing it, and I've created my own Hashcat um, rule set, which, anyone heard of the Hob rules? The, well, I looked at Hob's rules, they're, they're really good, I was really impressed. Um, he's got two in his GitHub. Uh, the first one is really good, it's quite simple, he calls it, and it, it, I was impressed. The second one is insane. Even with like four graphics cards, you're still talking days, weeks, months to crack things. But I know why he's done it. Um, Anyway, so what do rules do for people who don't know? Rules will take a word list, a standard word list, and they will lowercase or uppercase letters. They will append characters to the start or end. They will only append characters that you've told it to, and they will only uppercase or lowercase where you've told it to. They will duplicate sections as defined. So password could become, let's say, password, password. They'll reverse words as well if defined, if told to. So I won't say password backwards. Uh, and replace letters with characters. What they don't do, which is what Rocktastic did do, uh, in day was they didn't have football teams. It doesn't do anything magic. It literally just does what you tell it to do. It doesn't add additional content. And when I'm doing internals, I started noticing a lot of people are using football teams. Um, cities is massive, well, like London. You go to London, a lot of them will have London as a password. Liverpool will have Liverpool as a password. Manchester, Man you see where I'm going. It doesn't do that. So I'll be getting hashes, and let's say using Rocky and using it with rules. You still aren't going to crack them. You have to have a good dictionary to start with. So if you look at the LinkedIn dump, it's 36 million SHA-1 hashes, I believe. Uh, with Rocktastic on his Jack Jones, it took me 3 hours and 33 minutes. Using the Hob64 rule, which I do like, uh, it took me 12 hours and 48 minutes. So you can see there's a difference. Now, if you're thinking, what the hell were you doing that on? Well, obviously, we've all got one of these at home, haven't we? <laughs> just lying around. We've got a 20K machine that's sitting around to be used. No, unfortunately, the reality is we got one of these. So I think you just need a good sized dictionary when you're on the road or if you want to get a hash quick and you just want to have a good, quick go at it. Right, so we've got domain creds. Is everyone happy with that? No questions? Right, we've got domain creds. Uh, external tax services. One factor authentication. Um, it's massive still. Why are people not using two factor? I don't know. So many tests are fine, there's no two-factor. It's ridiculous. So you've got creds, what can you access? Well, we know these are the classics. Outlook, I said earlier, I'll go on and get everyone's email address at that point. Um, Citrix, Citrix is great. It's not, someone slapped me here. It's not quite a VPN. It gives you a, a kind of restrictive access to what they want you to. And you can sit there and you can do a breakout test. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. You can see what you can access. You can still get information from it. This, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> I love, I love Office 365. Who uses it here? How do you feel about it? It's great. I tell you what, right. Office 365 is fantastic for centralization, um, central management, um, business users. It's great. It's cheap, really, really cheap. It's supposed to be easier to support. It's going to be an NMCSC in Office 365. Probably. It's just like the. What I personally don't think it does, and I've noticed with Office 365, when you read the literature, normally somewhere at the bottom, small is secure, you know, security or secure. I don't think it's very secure. By default, it's one factor authentication. So previously, we've got Outlook, we've got Citrix. Now, Excel, Word, um, PowerPoint, this is the best one. OneDrive, which I found on many of tests, maps to their C drive or their personal drive. You know, what do attackers want? That they want documents normally. So if you're going to embarrass someone or you're going to make money from someone, you want documents on that person. It's all there now. If you use it, two factor authentication is definitely the way to go. Microsoft have an app for it and it can be done. There are text messages, I believe. Right. This is the, this is the best. I, I just get really happy at this point. Um, <coughs> I come from a network background. I used to have to do RAS VPNs for people. They were pretty hard to configure. SSL VPNs, you just turn them on. You tick a box, and it's pretty much done. Um, connect it to AD. Yep, done. Wicked. No two-factor authentication. Oh, we don't need it. We'll give them access now. So, use a VPN. Your SSL in. You're on their internal network. So you've sent an email. Let's say within five minutes, you've got 20 or 30 different hashes. You've cracked. 10, maybe 9, 10 of them. So within 10 sort of minutes, 15 minutes, you're on the internal network. I don't have to travel two hours in a car. I can do it remotely now. Says what I've just said. Okay, so we're on the inside. Um, I've actually shown you an example of the typical sort of thing I do. Uh, this is quite high level, um, but I'll talk people through it a little bit. So we're on the inside network, um, Metasploit. Yes, we use it, we know about it. Um, using the credentials stolen from the external side, reword that. Any internal with credentials is so much easier. First thing I do on an internal is try and get credentials quickly. Once you've got credentials, you can enumerate things, you can start to look for things. That's exactly what I do. I start looking for misconfigured network shares. So I'm on the external side, using Metasploit, I start looking for any misconfigured network shares. That means anything writable access, and a C dollar or an admin dollar. Now, how often do I find that a standard user is allowed access? 90% of my tests? That's pretty shocking. It's pretty, it's pretty bad. If they don't, I'll have to spend hours trying to find another way, but I will. But that's pretty much what you find is very quickly you've found a writable share. The reason why a writable share is so good because from a Pentest background, you'll know there's a rival share, you can upload a shell to it. So we talked this morning about shelter, uh, not shelter, being confused. Um, you can upload a shell, and you're away to go. Right, so we act, we're looking to exploit the network shares, which I've just discussed, I spoke about Vail, I meant to say, or Veal, not shelter. Right, so we've got access onto the machine, we've got a shell, we're here, we're off. You need to elevate rights. Now, you're always going to try to get system. And I know it's not an exploit, but it's functionality. But you're going to try it. And if you haven't got um, UAC, user access control, just make sure I'm getting the acronyms right, uh, enabled on the machines, which a lot of people don't, um, because they find it annoying, it pops up saying, you need administrative rights to run this. Anyway, if they haven't got that enabled, get system often works. And if it hasn't, you look very quickly for missing patches. Hopefully you get a missing patch that you can elevate. Anyway, let's say we, we have got local admin rights, the hashes, which is very, very common. What do you do next? Using those hashes, Microsoft doesn't need password, as a lot of you know, it just needs the password hash. So we just spray it out across the network. Now, password reuse on the local administrative account is so common, it's unreal. Um, people haven't heard of apps. Um, Microsoft have tried to address this by allowing you to change every single local admin password. Uh, it scares people using it. I understand why it scares them, because when it initially came out, it knocked everyone out. But now, it's usable, and it should be used. But I find that local admin is the same on pretty much every internal I do. Local admin is on the same on every box. And anyone who's thinking why, 
If you have a server or a PC, you don't have to keep rebuilding it from scratch. So let's take a copy of that. And because Microsoft doesn't solve the hashes, when you copy it over and over and over again, it just keeps the same hash. So if you pass that hash, which Microsoft accepts, it will let you log in with it. So you've gone from three or four credentials, SSL VPN, you're winning, you're in, you found shares you can write to, you've got a shell on it, you've got a local admin, you sprayed it out, and all of a sudden you realize you've got 90 to 100 machines that you can now access. That's pretty interesting, I think. Right, so you access your target. Enumerate data. Who's had a Mimicats? I've spoken about this morning. There you go, you're off. Mimicats will read or give you the password in clear text of the presently logged on user. So all these machines here, you can now see all the user's passwords. In a very short time, no prior knowledge, remote location, complete asset compromise. Um, domain administrative accounts. I'm told it's not the only reason why we break in and do internals. Very common that we'll get domain admin doing this from this sort of attack. Right, so we'll look at some real world examples. Who likes receiving phishing emails? Yeah, they're amusing often. But you just look at them, they're incredible. This was the best one that came to me, and I'm thinking, I wanted to reply. <laughs> the NatWest team have decided to email me. Where have they emailed me from? Well, looking it up, it seems to be from North Carolina. <coughs> I'm starting to think that's a bit suspicious. That is an example of the real world people out there. That's actually quite a good one. My boss sent me this. <laughs> one he has. If anyone can read this, it's just. Painful. I'm having the computer supporting business for Middle Eastern com community. I'm not going to carry on reading it because it's just dreadful. It doesn't even have anything to click. I don't even know if there's an attachment. I think it's just someone sitting there randomly trying to pwn people with no, no macros in pay, you know, in documents. They've got no UNC. It's just dreadful. <laughs> right. Hopefully people will follow me at some point on Twitter. Anyone who does presently follow me on Twitter, there's people I used to go moaning about recruiters. Recruiters, who gets recruitment emails all the time? Who, send, who gets them sent to their corporate email address? Yeah. Oh, and that's shocking, I do. Uh, literally, it's like there's, there's a line you cross. I'm trying to poach you from an actual business via their mail system where their system admins can read it and people. It's just wrong. Anyway, so I'll report back to these recruiters. So stop sending me bloody emails. And got nothing. So I sent it back to his manager going, can you stop your employer from sending it to my corporate email? I've got nothing. A few months later, I've got another one. So we chatted about this on Twitter, and I said, stuff it. I'm going to use them as um, templates. So there I am. I'm telling people, that's it. I'm going to add them as templates, get access into their devices. And here you go. Here's the example. So any recruiter who watches this at any point, you send me an email, and that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, about to be probably fired after this. <laughs> There's another one. Uh, these work incredibly. Um, it's scary how successful these are. You don't hit your, you know, your top people with these. You hit your normal employees like ourselves, and you find so many disgruntled employees, so many people looking for something. You don't even have to write much in them. You just suggest that there might be something better out there. People have a nose. They'll click on it. They'll, they'll want to see. You're just getting hash after hash after hash. Right, so I had a test recently. This is a really good test for me. I had a really hard test. And they're really impressive. These are Palo Alto. And uh, I know it's advertised Palo Alto. But it pretty much blocked every email I sent in. And I've never come across a notice. But it just blocked everything. And they, they blocked my first initial emails that I sent, the sort of internal emails with the SharePoint style thing. And they blocked it because it was spooked. They looked at the domain to the IP address. The Palo Alto group apparently automatically said, no, you're not getting it. Blocked it. I thought that was quite impressive. So how do I get around it? Any ideas? What's that, sorry? Don't spoof. Don't spoof. Very good answer. Don't spoof, no. Send it from Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I said before, I don't give up. Well, at least you don't give up. Um, how do you, I, I feel like I fail. If I have to give someone a report and I haven't at least attempted properly, I wouldn't sleep. Right, Yahoo, Gmail, Rage123, they're legitimate email accounts. Um, they're not spoofed. Who would send these? Um, small little businesses might. Small little businesses who aren't that IT savvy, they're very capable of using Yahoo still or Gmail as their corporate email. Um, so there you go, that was sent in with an attachment. It worked. Right, I kind of mentioned this earlier. This, here it is. When you open a Word document, protected view. Um, everyone's seen that, right? Has anyone ever read it? <laughs> just, just check it. Um, people just click it, and they click it, and click it, and click it. I've got my notes here. I need to just get this correctly. Basically, 
I've spoke to a lot of people about this, and it, the, the general answer is it's just fatigue. People are fed up of it and just want to click it and get on with it. The, the, my theory is this, potential theory. Microsoft Word opens up by default in protected mode in something called uh, print mode. And we write things in web mode. Now, the second you press that, it goes from print mode to web mode automatically. So it's kind of like saying, if you just keep doing it, keep pressing it, it'll put you to where I want you to be, or where you want it to be. So people have got used to that. They look at it, they think it's formatted incorrectly, it looks weird and random. So they just click it, and instantly it formats correctly. So I kind of think, it's messed up here. It should keep you in the same mode, so you still have to then go down to the bottom and click the little icon to change it back into the mode that you read in. Right, this is where it starts getting actually exciting. Is everyone still enjoying this? So I carry on? This is where it starts to clear it up again. Um, Emails are fantastic, always amuses me, keeps me happy. But this is just even better. Um, this is when it goes up a level. <coughs> Who's credential harvesting here? Do you want to do credential harvesting? I know a lot of this team do. We all do. We, we're at Netshoe, we do a bit of everything. It's how we like it. it keeps us entertained. Um, credential harvesting will clone your website. And we will send people an email and say, please go to here and check your authentication still works. And people will stick their, their credentials in and get them in clear text. And um, we'll see them on the back end of the server we control in clear text. And it all looks legit. You can put HTTPS, um, an SSL certificate on it. It can make it look really, really nice. Uh, you, sometimes I do this. It's really stupid, actually, but I like it. I'm a bad kind of person. I'll clone their Outlook sites and I'll add their logo at the top to make it look pretty, even if their own one hasn't got that on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just do it because I think it looks nice. It's a fine detail I just like doing. And I'll, I'll, now I'm going to close your ears here from the bosses. I'll sometimes spend... 15 minutes to do it to make it look pretty nice pants. <laughs> 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 there goes my lays. Um, right, looking at the bottom of the source code of it, um, one of my colleagues said to me, he goes, cause one of my colleagues and me, we worked on this for a long time together, and he said, drop in an image tag, see what, see what happens. So I thought, well, that's wicked. So we drop in an image tag, and bang, you get hashes just from viewing it with IE. So if you use IE, and you go on the internet, and you look at that website, you're sending us the hashes, as long as 445 outbound is loud and follow up. And if you think about who would do that, who would be smart enough to just look at it and not put the credentials in? Generally, the IT team who, who, who know about the test. <laughs> and they're the ones with DA. They've got domain admin. That's painful. So you, 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 never, you never slap the hand that feeds you, but it's just, just so tempting. So I have to, they'll get a little, a little email back from me midway through a test. <coughs> Cheers for the credits. <laughs> How was in Edge animators, are you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
the save it. Someone asked me why I don't do live labs because they go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, refresh. We've got hashes. So just viewing the site, you get hashes, which is exactly what I just said. <coughs> Are there any questions about that? Hang on. Who's? Feel free. You keep saying 445. Yes. If you just block 445, it'll pull back to 139. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you very much. I've learned something. So there you go. <laughs> to be fair, though, I shouldn't be telling clients to just block one port out there. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case everyone goes, oh, well, if yeah, well, they just block one port out there, we're all set. This is the difference we were joking around earlier. But the difference between me being ethical and not ethical. There's always that little bit in the back of your head you think, that's not going to be so fun next year, I'm going to retest it. But we're, we're paid to tell them the honest truth. So. Right, I will get down. Right, so here we go. Right, now, when I initially did, I don't like the term research. It makes me sound like I'm some sort of professional kind of scholar person. Um, you said about looking at the internet. Yeah, I googled it. Um, I never went to uni, I never went to college. So for me, I left school with nothing and um, slowly worked my way up. I did a horrible job wrapping cling film and pallets for ages, cutting and burning my fingers, looking at people in offices thinking, that's the job I want. I don't know what you do, but I want it because it's clean and it's nice and you treat with respect. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job in the office delivering mail. So I'm like a 19-year-old delivering mail, about 17, I'm delivering mail. And uh, no, not true with respect. And then um, realised quite quickly I didn't like it. So I went back to college at night time and did uh, Cisco exams, networking exams. Became a network engineer. I should have done this at the start. I, I need to fill some time. Um, <laughs> and basically worked my way up from a network engineer I worked for for a long time. And then I got into security. And I did security exams, uh, <coughs> certified ethical hacker, um, which we spit on. But I loved it at the time. I thought it was the best thing ever. It opened my mind. And then I joined a proper firm and I did crest exams. So I, I did actually do proper pen testing exams, and that's how I am here today. Uh, so that's kind of my background with regards to research and how I've got to where I am. When I was researching this, um, I, wanted, I, I wasn't happy with the fact it was just IE. Now, the majority of users do just use IE in corporate lots. Uh, it's, it's a massive amount of them use it. And when they don't use it, they'll have Firefox, but they'll also still have IE for those applications internally that uh, only support IE. Who is writing applications <laughs> only for IE? That they need a slap. <laughs> right, so you don't use IE, yet are you safe? Let's have a look. Who uses Responder here? <coughs> Good. Um, right, you're about to see what you're about to see now is over HTTP. Uh, so it's not over SMB, so if you allow, if you've blocked everything, but you still allow HTTP and HTTPS out, this will get you. Right, the difference is immediately, you'll get the prompt, because Responder will give you a prompt, so the HTTP. Now, I had a conversation with uh, Pete colleagues at Netitude, and they were saying, well, it's just credential harvesting at that point, it's not interesting, it's not, it's not such an exploitation. And would people put their credentials in or not? Yeah, they do, though. This is the thing, I've done it. And they do, they do put the credits in. Now, initially, I got really excited, and I heard a rumour that I thought proxies will auto-populate that for you. Now, I think it's pretty ruled out that now. I mean, from research, that's pretty much not a go -er. So when I've done this, I'm getting hash or hashes this way. People are actually typing them in themselves. And from experience from internals, when I've done sort of web app internals, is a classic example for this. If it uses a proxy, that'll come up anyway. And I have to put in the domain credentials that I've been given to do the web app test internally. So it, it kind of is a legitimate function that people will fill in. So here you go, I'm filling it in. <coughs> Hit send. Bang. There you go, across the internet, HTTP <coughs> hashes. Um, it's not the best, but it does work. It's just another way, is what I'm trying to say. And there you go, in the source code. Right, so that will affect any browser. Um, don't know about Safari, actually. It's interesting, I'm not afraid of Safari, but what corporate user sits on the phone in your office trying to connect to an internal site? So, right, one click is all it takes. So we've had hashes. 
Hashes are fantastic, but I have been doing this now for a couple of years, and I'm getting a little bit bored of just doing hashes. I'm very interested in, can you look at a website and get a shell off it, just looking at it? Now, unfortunately, I'm not about to launch a zero day. It's not, so far, I haven't found a way. And I've been reading lots of other people's like, really good research on this, and I don't know of a way. There is, there's some clever things you can do, but just looking at it doesn't work. What I'm going to show you here, in video five, is what I think is the closest thing to it. That's my YouTube blog, if I was interested. Um, right, so if you see there, I've got a normal SMB listener on that boy, and I've also got an interpreter listener. Now, this is interesting, I want to rewind that. This is a warning that people get. People are watching them, they're getting a shell. So just from clicking, going to that website and clicking, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you get a shell, and we get hashes. Now, I'll pause it at this point, we'll do it again. Right, so they click there, open. Now that, most people wouldn't have that warning. I have that warning because I like it. I want to keep it. Interestingly, you can't see very well, the publisher says Microsoft Windows. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's not my Microsoft don't publish that. I did, 10 minutes before. Don't know why you get it. It's another little quirk of Microsoft that I love, these sort of things. Um, there you go. Will people click on it? Will they not? All you got to do is tick it there and you'll never see it again. Most people will just do that. So, we're getting hashes and we're getting a interpreter shell. So from the outside, you inside, clicking a couple of things. Interesting to point out, obviously, with the you inside, you don't have to click anything. That would just automatically happen. So even if they didn't click, you'd still get the hashes. Right, I'm gonna show you the final one now, video. This is to show you that I use antivirus when I'm checking. Every obviously has to go for antivirus, because the last thing you do is get caught on an insert lock on a client site once you've sent an email in. So this pass is antivirus, if you class Windows Defender as antivirus. <laughs> it is, it's like, it's got it's pros and negatives. I, I like it. They don't, they don't do it. They buy it. Don't they? They, the, the database, the back end, they buy it from like three or four different vendors. So in essence, you're getting three or four different vendors in your AV. I had a chat with someone recently, uh, this week actually, about it. They said it's brilliant for this and this reason. There's definitely pros and negatives for it. Um, interestingly, I'll just put the dig in while I'm here. Semantic and McAfee never find anything. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones that are always out there, people pay a lot of money for them. Right, so this is interesting because if you look at the top, I'm mixing it up a bit here. CVs would often come as a PDF. So send them a PDF. So what I've done is a hyperlink from the PDF with UNC and a .hta file, which gives me a shell. So clicking on it, we'll see it again, bloody blast. This is just someone's CV. Click here for more information. Click here for, I don't know, something. Give them, give them a reason. Make it legit. There you go. Get a shell from it. Um, this sort of thing works. If you have an SE target, and it's something I do, uh, another thing I do, I don't just see SE targets as, um, how do I word this? Basically, I won't just go credential harvesting or I'll email some people. No, I'll, I'll see if they've got any job pages on their site. And if it's in scope, if it doesn't go after a third party, if I know it's internal, I'll do that. I'll send them a CV and stuff. I'll, I'll look at every angle. If it's a website, it's a gift. You just every angle you can think of, you want to you want to have a look at with SC. If you can upload a file, send them a Word document with something in. If you if, you, if you ask for a CV, send them a PDF with something in it like that. Right. And again with PDF. Right. If people are interested. Because a lot of people will be saying, well, .hta files, which uh, I use the tool Unicorn by David Kennedy, worth mentioning for that, to create those. Really, really simple to use. Uh, someone said to me, well, they don't work with IE settings. Um, I said earlier, I use default VMs that I get. That default setting they club, medium high. And I've seen a lot of clients have their IE settings at that. And you just see it works. If you boost up that setting, the .hta, you won't get an interpreter shell off it, but you still get your hashes, interestingly doesn't stop you and say at all. I get really confused with UNC and UAC. It's acronyms. Right. Are there any real questions now? Different questions towards the end. Please go for it. Um, so one real question. Does the recent WPAT patch, R16, stop this from working? Because they did change how you <coughs> work. So does it still work for the latest patch? What I can tell you is I update my VMs. Um, I've gone to latest, latest and greatest, and it hasn't stopped you. So um, I don't think they 
I think we all have this concept. I don't, I don't know, I don't work for Microsoft. They sent me a cheeky email actually, I was tempted to apply. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure they, they research this stuff. I don't think they say it's an export, it's a functionality. Uh, it's like if you were to delete it, it would break a lot of things on Microsoft's side. And I, 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 I think that's the thing. I don't think it's legit, but I think just let it go. I could be wrong, they might sit there hating it and spend all the time, let me stop this, let me stop that video talking about it again, stop it. I don't know. <laughs> Any questions, please? We need to fill some time. I don't know how long I've been. I've got loads of uh, messages. Phil, cool. uh, Not quite a question. Do you know what you're saying about the word tests? Uh, yes. People may find this useful, may know about it, may not. The design crashes to org, and it's kind of like a anti-crypto thing. So you can join your Kraken rig. So ours is called the Kraken to that. And you can download things like the LinkedIn breach, but they give you the full word list back, and they're great oh, cool. to add to your word list. Uh, which you get like the LinkedIn password. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate that everyone heard that. So it's always worth. No one knows everything. Always ask other people. I spend my entire life asking people things. Um, who's first? Point out. Let's have a fight. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, so, like explicit proxies and things like that, do they not prevent anything like this? Um. Yeah, this is something I need to allow. It's something that I need to actually spend some time. It's hard because we all work. We don't have time. But the reality is. Clients use them, and I'm still getting it. So I think mean, the reality is, you can have all the toys in the world. Most people have got all the toys in the world, but it's not configured right. And that's no dig at any systems admin or anything. It's just most people are just given something. Here's the silver, you know, the bullet, or whatever. Here, this will fix it. And there's no training. So I don't know whether they're not configured correctly, or whether they could. Yes, you probably could. You could stop all of this if you just firewalled correctly. It would stop it. Um, if you had, the biggest one is employer internal training. Talk to people, tell them not to click on things, tell them not to just go, yeah, 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 send them a hash. That's that's the, the other thing, really. Does that answer that? Or I, I don't know, I can't answer you straight up, I'll be honest. Fair enough. I did a politician answer there, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, so basically, what you're saying is you don't need a traditional phishing method of all entering a password and, and you log into your SSK and you're just getting a click on a link and then you either beep up and then you drop them in a file or you're calling out for that submission and it's happening twice. Precisely. So, you can. You can, you can. It doesn't have to be anything. You can make it be absolutely anything. You don't, you don't need to go as far as making it look pretty. I just like it to screenshot the report. How do you, how do you tackle that? I know you send me um, sort of images in your emails. I don't know that I'll look at a lot of I don't do that. Like that. That's interesting. Some of, some of my colleagues do. They'll send an image in the email. And if you send an image of the email, you get the, you know, the little like, the crosses yeah. on the images. And it'll say download here. And that, what they do is very clever. They'll say, um, here's a picture of so-and-so on holiday. And they'll make it really enticing. And people will download it. And when you download, you download the picture, um, it will then do the UNC request. I don't, uh, we all have our different techniques. I'm quite successful by doing that, they're successful at that. I don't like to give anyone a warning. If I, if, I, if I can do it without a warning on the screen, I will. And if you have just a hyperlink, as long as you're not putting an IP address in there, it's a UNC link, you don't get any warnings. But what you've got to do is you've got to entice them to click on it. And spoofing an internal email and telling people that it's a new service, and there's either two ways of doing it. It's a new service that's so cool we're going to want to look at. That's really hard to get working. Or you say something like, check your credentials still work. And that, that will get us to click it. Are there any more questions? Do but, you have an estimation on, on uh, how many users usually for a social engineering campaign are clicking from mobile devices or from desktop? Um, yes, I could. I, I, I can't just reel it off now. Um, it's quite a few. I will see Safari a lot in the log file, especially when you do credential harvesting and you see the credentials back end on an Apache server on the log file, you'll see exactly what uh, browser they've used. And loads, absolute loads, are using Safari. And yeah, that, that will stop me, you know, if we keep using Safari. But the, the reality is, your internal users, if you're sending 50 emails in, um, all different levels, a lot of users, most companies out there still don't give people nice phones. They'll be just using their, their normal desktop PC. So, yeah, yeah, you definitely do see that. And, yeah, at some point I'll get around to having a look at exploiting that because there's going to be a massive areas of exploitation there. It's just like mobile testing. We're, we're, it's humongous. The apps that are out there are dreadfully <coughs> little. There are, it's going to be loads of exploits. Go for it. So who, who, who are you? <laughs> yeah, when the net is you group. Um, yeah, so about the proxy thing, uh, just by chance really, about a year or so ago, um, I was doing some testing with a client that uh, they wanted all everything, even internal resources going through uh, TMG. And it's how they manage, they use TMG to use, well, domain.
domain related creds, domain related groups or the UKP to decide whether or not you could access particular internal websites. Uh, what, one of the things I've realized is that the file, <laughs> uh, URI, I can't remember what you describe it now, but the, the initial part of the uh, URL, um, file stuff bypassed it correctly. There you go. So he only handled HTTP, HTTPS. Yeah. She didn't care about you and so. File just just go around it. Functionality. functionality. Um, Thank you for answering that. That answers your question up there. Yeah. A, a, a correctly configured prop said so Bob, so a Microsoft engineer knows what he's doing, and he just broke it. Yeah, so I, I, well, to be honest, that, that's TMG. I wouldn't test it with TMG, but I would suspect that Squid or any other HTTP proxy would only handle HTTP, not far. Yeah. You wait for files configured to block out on the local file. Or if you redirect it to a proxy. Final question, anyone? Um, just before everyone runs off, there again, there's my Twitter. If you have any questions, um, DMs on all the time, don't wait to send me a message. Thanks.